guys, welcome to the first episode of our new podcast called Zebedextra v. Fibo. Fibo. It's not super important to know why those are our nicknames on this channel, but they are. On this podcast, we're going to be discussing some of our favorite things, which are literature and cinema. And we're going to be having a little bit of a debate about it, which is why it's called Zebedextra v. v. Yeah. Fibo. And um, we hope that you enjoy and have some fun. So the theory behind this podcast is that we both really enjoy these things, but our tastes are quite different in Very. what we enjoy. So I thought it would be fun to force the other person to watch slash read what we're interested in and then be able to hear what they uh. thought about it. So basically, I'm just like making him watch and listen to what I want him to listen to. Yes, however, that uh, turnabout is fair play. Yes. And, uh, so I've, I've already started to broaden her horizons with a little, you know, military science fiction to start off with. Case in point, our very first episode is not about a topic I chose. It's about one of Tim's favorite books. Yes. We are going to yes. be discussing the book called March Up Country by David Weber and... John Ringo. John Ringo. I wrote it down. Okay. I did take notes, you guys. So, Copious notes. <laughs> in this podcast, we're not going to be spoiler-free. We will, however, be like spoiler-free for a little while, but then we're definitely going to get into the meat of the books and cinema that we're talking about. So, um, as I said, I had never read this book before, and these are two of Tim's very favorite authors <laughs> that yes. wrote a piece together. Yes. And I had read something by which of these authors before wrote uh, the David book Weber. Read? David Weber wrote what's it called again? The uh, Honor Harrington series. Yeah, I re I read one of those because our daughter, our oldest daughter is actually named after yes. my great grandmother but also the main character from yes, that Honor, series. Honor Harrington. Yeah. So. so, um so I thought that before we got into like a full summary I thought we could start with just like, if I was going to sum this book up in one sentence. Not one word? No, not one word. Okay. One okay. sentence. I would describe this, in case you're trying to decide if you want to read this before you get the full summary. March Up Country mm -hmm. is a spacey <laughs> science fiction battle coming of age book. The next thing I thought would be good is if I let you know where this falls as the person who's reading this for the first time or the person who did not suggest the piece, um, where this falls on my tier of loved it, liked it, meh, or hated it. And where it falls for me is liked it. Okay. It's good. not a loved okay, it because good. there were definitely some parts that I was like seriously bored. No, but I got you. I liked it. I, I liked you. it more than I thought I would. In the future, we will be preemptively up, um, giving you the books that we're reading so you could read them with us and then be prepared. Oh, that would be good. Yeah. Oh, you didn't know that. I did not. <laughs> I did not. I'm, I'm kind of new to this whole podcast thing. All right. We start out, and this book is mainly about this prince. Yes. Of the, and he is his mother is the Empress of Man, which is yes. like basically the Empress of the Universe. Um, yes and no. Um there, there are other factions out there. Um, but like as far as I read in the first one, she seems to just be the boss of everything. She's the boss of, she's the boss of the core worlds of the empire. Uh -huh. um, as with any empire, there's always other groups that are outside the empire. Um, but they don't come into main play or is that who the saints are? That is, uh, the Saints are one Okay, of so we do see one other, like, main faction. Yes, yes. Okay, so the Prince is a member of this family. He has two older siblings, right? He does. But he's kind of like the spoiled brat, and he, you're just, in the beginning of the book, you're like, okay, this is a spoiled brat dude. He doesn't want to do what he's told. He doesn't have any responsibility. Nobody trusts him with anything. And no respect for anybody. Yeah. So, that's your initial impression of him. And happily, one of the things I like the most about this book is that he has a nice character arc. Because in the beginning, he is a flawed character, and you really don't like him. Very much so. Very so, much so. And even his family doesn't like him, pretty much. Like, none of his, none of the people on the ship he goes on really respect him, except for 
his tutor, and his valet. So main character is Roger McClintock. The family name of the people who rule the empire is McClintock. And that's like a big name. He wants to live up to the McClintock name mm. later. Yes. Not yes. so much at the beginning. Okay, so... Um, I, I, would say, I would say at the very beginning, he feels that the name is a burden. Oh, yeah. That's a good way to look yeah. at it. Definitely. Because he doesn't... Yeah. He's how old would you say he is at the beginning? Um, I would say he seems like a really mid, young nineteen. That's what he seemed like to see, me. See, I was gonna say that, but then you get to listening to some of the other things, and and I wanted to say kind of early twenties. So yeah, 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 yeah kind of. He's, I mean, he's sexually experienced, mm -hmm. not like hugely, but he's had some relationships. Yes. Yes. So we know he's not like super young, but he acts very young. Yes, he does. Okay. He does. All right, so um, the Queen Mother, Empress McClintock, she's going to send Roger on an expedition. He's going to get in a spaceship. And, like, kind of the point of the expedition, she doesn't know what's going to happen, but she wants him to kind of grow up and learn where his place is in the family. So the spaceship that... Sorry, I'm reading my notes, guys. The spaceship that Roger's on is sabotaged with bombs, like, right at the beginning. That's the other thing I really liked about mm -hmm. this is we just went right into the intrigue. Yeah. I would call this an adventure book. There's a little bit of mystery, but more it's just like adventure. And I appreciated that it was like yeah. boom, 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 yeah. with plenty of character development as well. Yes, that, that was a, that, that's one of the amazing parts of this book is it, it incorporates so many different things. Um, you, you're right. The, the character development is there. And it's not like just character development of the main character. You get, um, there's probably six or seven side characters. Yeah, or that, more. Well, there's more, that you but care I, think, about. I think there's six or seven of the become main and central to the story mm -hmm. uh, in this book. Yeah, and I like that a lot. Yeah. Um, okay, so it's sabotaged with bom bombs by an ensign, and she was likely mentally hacked, something called a zombie toot. Hmm. So they all have like these brain computers that are hooked up to their brain that lets them be really smart, access a ton of information, but people can hack it right. and control them. Right. That okay. is correct. Okay. So what all gets taken down from these bombs? Because it seems like it got physically destroyed mm -hmm. a little bit, but also their online system got destroyed. Yeah. Yeah. So so basically it was a, a multi-pronged attack. Um, the uh, the ensign who her uh, toot is, is what they call the Is the toot implant. short for something? I don't know, but it's it's what they call their, their <laughs> implants. Um, so the one who had her toot hacked and became a you know, toot zombie. Yeah. Um, she planted bombs in engineering to shut down the, uh, I believe it's a tunnel drive system. So they would drop out of warp. Actually, the whole thing was set up to explode and blow the whole thing oh, up. Oh, it was supposed to blow the whole ship. It was supposed okay. to blow the ship up. But okay. um, that gets thwarted. Because of Ava Kasudik, my because favorite of character. Ava, yeah. She's a sergeant major, by the way. She is. I described her as strong, organized, and efficient. So the ship has to detour. Do we know, remember where it was going in the first place? Uh, yes. I can't remember the name of the planet, but they were going for uh, a grumbly oil ceremony. Um, he was going to oversee some ceremony. Yeah, yeah. But, okay. But he was all upset about it because grumbly oil smells really foul. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's some good character plot point there. Even though, even though it should be pointed out, that is the base of one of his favorite colognes is the grumbly oil. Oh. Yeah. Okay. I like that. Yeah. All right. So the ship has to do detour to an Imperial outpost planet Mar. Duke. Some things about the planet, they have dream spice, piracy, hazardous flora and fauna was what my first impression of what this planet's going to be like. Because they talk a lot about, oh no, we're going to have to wreck on this planet. This is what's on that planet. And then there's like a big thing about how they're going to even get there because mm -hmm. they might not even get there. Their ship's right. so messed up. So yes. they discovered that a warship is following them. Would you say it was a warship? So it, uh, it it's a cruiser. Um, that sounds like a personal ship well uh, no a cruiser is is slightly larger okay um it, it's it's not the the full scale because what they're worried about is the uh because they notice the the cruiser following them uh one of the things they're concerned with is a a saint uh what do they call it a para something anyhow it, it basically has a bunch of parasite ships that are these cruiser size 
Um, and so they're worried about that. Oh, they also we also learned that the Mardukins are grizzly bear size with long feet, horns, three-fingered hands, and they're covered in slime. Yes. So Roger's learning this about these people. And I guess like he should have known more about them through his studies, but he was like pieced out. Well, um, actually, the, the, with that, there, there's probably not, if you look at the book, um, there's really no one on that ship that knows anything about the Mardukans. What, what they do know is from their Encyclopedia Galactica. Which is in their toots. Which can be stored in their toots, yes. Oh, man. Okay. So they have a really long decision to make about what to pack for their trek across Marduk because they yes. can only pack what they can carry on their backs for now. Right. And um, Roger wants to take, like, all his clothes. Of course. And he thinks that other people should carry all his stuff for him. And so you learn, you're learn getting more about, like, how selfish he is. Mm -hmm. And Ponner is... So there's, like, two captains at the beginning. There's the captain of the main ship. Yes. And then he's not going to be that important because, spoiler, spoiler. he's going to die. <laughs> whoop, whoop, whoop. Spoiler alert. Um, and then there's Ponner, who is the captain of the Bronze Battalion. Yes. Which is just the military force that she sent to be on this trip with him. No. So... Um the way it works is there's um, there's three levels to the bronze battalion. Uh, they are the special bodyguards of the Empire of Man's successors. Oh, in, in the, so um, so they're specifically to him or his other family members whenever they go somewhere. Right, but bronze is the lowest level. So for Roger. For Roger, okay. because he's not directly in the line right. of, succession. of succession. Okay. okay, so this other ship is like slowly creeping up on them. And they're mm -hmm. like, yes. at first they're like, maybe he's not a bad guy. But then they're like, okay, yeah, he's a bad guy. So it opens fire on him and combat starts. Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, they, I wrote down, they survived the first encounter and another ship makes its way towards them. Yes. So they blow up the first ship. They, they do destroy the first ship. And then their thought is, well, you, probably there's another ship that's watching this ship, mm -hmm. and it's probably going to come up, and in fact, it does. Right, and it does. And it's like, has more powerful... No, it's actually the same style ship. Okay, Remember it's just how like I his mentioned... wingman. So while they're all discussing like the specifics about what Roger can carry, it suddenly dawns on him that the entire ship is going to sacrifice himself, themselves to yes. get Roger's little ship to go. Right. So... He, it's, it's like your first time that he's realizing that even though, like, I don't know if he makes this realization now. Like, even I, though they no. probably all hate him, they're going to die for him. Yeah, I, I, I don't think that realization actually dawns on him until well after he meets the, the Marduk. That they all hate him? No, that um, realize that they are willing to lay down their life to protect him even though they don't like him. Okay. Well, in this moment, he realizes that everybody's going to die, except for the people getting on this little Correct. thing to Correct. go out. And so it's like, all it's a huge ship, right? And it's like all the engineers, all the mm -hmm. cooks, all the everything. So it's si significant. Um, the shuttles have to crash land on dry lake beds. Yes. Um, I also made a note that the word dweeb is used twice. Dweeb, nice. Dweeb is used twice. I didn't look up what year this book was written, but that was funny to me. Okay. So we've got yeah. toots and dweebs. Toots and dweebs. So they crash land in this dry lake bed. Yes. And they all start to march. Yep. They're marching. And Roger happens to be experienced and love safari. Yes. So he's used to marching through places like this and encountering lots of wildlife. And we already know that their wildlife and their fauna their flora and fauna yes. are dangerous, Can be dangerous and like right. aggressive. Yes. So um, Roger and Ponner continue to disagree how the company should be run. So really, Roger's in charge. Heads. Roger's like technically in charge. So technically, in the in the uh, order of things, he's the colonel. Yeah. So he actually runs the battalion. Um, however, up until. This, this moment, moment yeah. he has never concerned himself with yeah. anything. He did take the military training, though. It did it did discuss that, that, that right. he's had military training. But not very that. much, right? Well, 
even if it was very much, it was not put to use until... Yeah, he's had no field experience. No field but experience. But Ponder has. But or Ponder not. has. Yeah, okay. Yes. Um, so they continue to disagree. And Roger's just like so... Like the gall that he could think that he could tell the 75-year-old man how to do stuff. Yes. It's very clear. Well, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step back from this for just a second. And I'm going to say... Um, one of the things about Roger mm -hmm. is he's very immature. Right. Right. And you know how when you're you're with somebody who's a, who's a bit immature, um, they have a tendency to say things or uh, stuff just kind of blurts out of their mouth without them realizing it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what happens to Roger here a lot is, you know, like something surprises him and boom, out of his mouth comes... The absolute worst mm -hmm. thing to say. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he usually almost instantly regrets it. Instantly. Yeah. Instantly. But, yeah. but it's one of those things where, you know, as the prince, yeah. how do you, how do you back away from, you know, what you're, what you've been saying? Yeah. So they're marching and Roger sees this beast mm -hmm. and he's like, well, I don't really want my peeps to all get killed by this beast so he gets ready to shoot it and does mark does ponder tell him not to he's like no don't shoot this creature uh yes but as you'll find out in about two minutes when when phoebe gets there um my name's phoebo phoebo sorry <laughs> so what you'll find out in about two minutes when phoebo gets there <laughs> is the fact that um even though it is an herbivore it's a very aggressive herbivore right so do you think that means it wants to kill but not to eat? Right. Okay. It, it's defending territory is okay. what it is. So Roger decides to shoot, and by shooting him, he in effect, in effect saves this Mardukin who was running away from the beast. Yes. And the reason we talked in detail about this, because the Mardukin he saves is a very important person to very, the character Very, very important. Okay. Um, now this person, who we learn's name is Cord. Cord. Um, he says that he owes Roger a life debt, and so now he has to follow Roger until he pays the life debt, and Roger's like, no. And Ponner's like, no, right? Yeah, everybody's like, no. Yeah, like, darn it. Yeah. Now this person's joined to our yes. group that we have to march with, and they don't know if that's going to be bad or whatever. So Cord tells them um, that they need to hurry to get to his village because mm. there are vampires called Yodin, yeah. that are going to come out at night and suck their blood. Yes. Yeah. And so they're like, okay, well, let's get a move on. In fact, they can't get there in time. So they do have right. to camp out at night. Um, well, it should, be, it should be noted, too, that one of the reasons they can't get there in time is the difference in species. Um, oh, yeah. They're much taller they're and have a longer taller, stride. much longer stride. And right and now they're not riding anything. No, no riding anything. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So they can't make it there. They camp. And... In fact, a vampire sucks someone's blood and just like mm. totally yes. disintegrates them or something. Yep. yep. One of the reasons this book is not a love is because I don't love the descriptions of these bodies just mm. being totally annihilated. It was not my fave. <laughs> so that's a thing. Um, it's not in there maybe as much as it probably could be, but yes. it's in there enough that I'm like, ugh, like cringy, cringe. Yeah. Okay. That's not even the worst one. So um, <laughs> they make it to the village, and Roger and Cord have a... Oh, by the way, sometime in here, there's a tree that attacks somebody. Like a tree grabs the lady or something. Oh, oh, oh. No, so I, I, I know what you're talking about. It's a worm that's actually attached to the tree. Oh. It's what becomes the yachting. The yachting. Okay, it's yeah. like a baby yachting. Yeah. It, and it still sucks it dry. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And at that point, did they think... If we had better armor, this wouldn't happen? Is that what the thought process is? They don't have the right armor for this um, planet? Well, what Korg tells them is they they don't... They, they look at everything, but they don't look hard enough. Um, they don't ever look up. Mm. Um, you know, because in, in the military, you're usually looking for threats on a, you know, on a swivel, but not necessarily okay. up and They're down. They're not used to a planet's trees holding dangerous yeah, things. Yeah, and, and according to Cord, like the uh they're really easy to avoid oh. if you just have like a leather covering over your head. Oh, and he has one? 
Oh, yeah, Corden has one. And something else important to know is this planet rains like all day long constantly or like there's a small break but it's usually raining it's it's usually yeah it's it's like a and it's very very hot yeah according to cord they have about six monsoons a day <laughs> i can't even imagine one monsoon i know right they make it to the village and roger and cord have a little ritual that has to do with the fact that he owes him a life debt and Eleonora is O'Casey's okay, first name. Eleonora, you are correct. Eleonora, the tutor, tells Roger that according to this ritual, it means that Cord is not only enslaved to Roger, but that he is now married to Roger. She's trying to explain to him what just happened, right? She's like, this is... This is significant because Roger significant. was just like, whatever. He's like flipping. He He's... ate some... I had to eat slime off of his back. That was yeah. gross, but whatever. Yeah, it was gross. And it's not quite right, but the analogy is there because um, they discuss being bound to somebody else. Okay. Okay. So, but mostly she's just wanting to impress into Roger. This is very important to Cord. Yes. Okay. And to yes. the rest of the culture around us. Right. Um, Cord tells the king that they received poor quality spearheads, which resulted in his nephew's death. Yes. Actually, it, you, you have that backwards. Okay. The chief told him that he'd. His oh. nephew died. Oh, okay. So the chief's like filling him in on what happened yeah. while he was gone. Yeah. And, okay. And the other thing of note on that is uh, the nephew that died was um, his shaman in training. Oh. Yeah. So, so now he doesn't have one. Right. So there's oh. no. The, there's, but is he? He's kind of like pieced out of that job now because he's got to follow Roger. He is, and that's why. That's one of the reasons why he took. Uh, his nephew's death so hard is because now there's not a replacement now there's no replacement because he was hoping to be able to you know talk to him before he left and you know pass along some other things and, and now he can't hmm. okay um so there might be a bunch more stuff in here but i'll tell you what the next thing is that i noted was that roger asks despero this person that he is interested in because she's beautiful she's a sergeant squad leader yes. he asks her to braid his hair so yes. he has very long beautiful genetically enhanced hair through yes. science and he doesn't know how to braid his hair because somebody else has always braided always it, for done him. it for him so one of my favorite parts of the book was him asking her to braid his hair yeah so i don't know if that impacted you as much as me but i enjoyed that a lot. Uh, yeah i i enjoyed that too because it it was it was one of the things where he's finally kind of coming off his high horse yeah and being like hey i don't know everything right can you help me can you that? help me yeah yeah and and he he made sure to note to her that it's not like i'm gonna have you do this every day yeah i just want you to show me how to do it mm -hmm. why didn't he ask his valet because he her. likes her. She, she is, she's cute. I, gotta admit. <laughs> I don't know why he didn't ask Matsugi, but the point is, is that he made it to 20 something, whatever, and never learned how to do his sure. own hair. Sure. And now he's like, okay, I'm going to figure out how to do this. So, um, so there's another person that's important to the plot. His name is Julian. He is a squad <laughs> leader. And he and others discover a conspiracy among the Mardukan houses, and they leverage that they'll help the king squash the conspiracy. It has to do with the spears for aid in getting the supplies they need for their travel. Did yes. I get that right? Yeah, you, you skipped Kinda. a bit, but yes. Is there anything important I skipped? Um, well, you should note that they're not still in his village. Oh, they're... at this part, they're not at the village? No, 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 no. I think they are. Nope. They, they've moved on to the next uh, the next town. Oh, there's other Mardukans with them now, not just Cord, right? So who's with yes. them? Cord's um, nephews? Yeah, he, he has some... Uh, he, he's brought some from his village. Um, I, I believe it was one or two of his nephews. My next note I wrote is, is Matsuki, the valet, by the way, is he in love with Roger? Ooh, that is a very good question. Because I got definitely in love with Roger vibes right here, right after they melt the people. So, I'm going to tell you... You don't have to give me any spoilers, but just know that this is what I was thinking about at this time. I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. And I can see where you would get that. Um, this series has three books, by the way. It does. And I would say, read book two. Okay. 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 So, yeah. I wasn't totally off? Um, or I was totally two. off. <laughs> read book two. Okay. 
Um, there's not a lot. There's like almost no relationshipness in this book, in this first one. Yeah, that is true. But like Matsugi being like obsessed with Roger, I was like, maybe he's in love with him. So that's what I was thinking. Okay, the next plot point and so in this part you're gonna have to let me know again if i'm jumping over huge things because the next thing i wrote down is that julian lightens the mood by crying over the comms about dying and never seeing anyone again oh. he loves them but this is contrasted with their slaughter of the cronolta and dooming them to extinction so literally he's <laughs> like we're about to kill all these people and the rest of their species is gonna be gone so, sorry about that but now he's making a joke well okay so Let's back up a little bit because you you did skip. Did I jump from one fight to the next? You did. You I thought that's what I did. You literally jumped from one to the next. I fell asleep. Ouch. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Weber and Mr. Ringo. She fell it asleep. It was because of the describing the weapons and the battle, and I was yeah. just like, no. No, no worries. This no worries. isn't about a person's thoughts um, or feelings. Nope. So basically, they, uh, they leave the ambush. Mm-hmm. And now they're racing to try and get to Voitan. Voitan, which they think has nobody in it, right? Right. Okay. And they're right. Right. It's it's completely ruins. Um, but they're they're trying to get there so that they can have some sort of uh, battlements to work from. Mm -hmm. um, what ends up happening is the Cronulta. There's a huge mass. Yeah, the, 16,000 or something yeah, I wrote down. Well, so one portion of the Kernolta, um main force catches up to the humans before they get to Voitan. And so there's a there's another little fight scene in there and um it it kind of it's kind of humorous to me. Somebody gets injured and the main medic uh which they don't have many of um, I wrote down his name. Debrescu. Debrescu, yes. Um, goes to rescue one of the um, Marines that's been injured. Debrescu to the rescue. Debrescu <laughs> to the rescue. Um, anyhow, so he goes to rescue this Marine, and um, they they get surrounded, and they get cut off. One of the bad things about this is that uh, Roger... Um, Roger has like a, a hero complex a little bit. And so he goes charging in to help. Does he have a sword or a gun? So at this point, he has his mahout. That's the gun. No, that's Patty. His, the, the, oh, yeah, we didn't talk about that. They, they, they get him loaded up and... Um, they get him loaded up. Does that mean he's like in a super suit? No, he, they get him on a stretcher. Oh, because he's injured? Yes. Oh, well, not, we're not talking about Roger. Okay. Right. Um, but now Roger is like in the middle of all these Cronulta. Oh. And they're, they're, they're surrounding him. And uh, Ponner uh, takes a minute to look at his HUD, uh, heads up display for those not in the know. And he notices that Roger's icon is like out in the middle of the Cronulta. And so he's quite upset with Roger at this point. Okay. Because his whole job and everybody's whole job is to make sure Roger doesn't die. Yep. To get Roger right. back to, to the Empire. And um, so he, he yells at Julian to get all the uh, the battle armor suits. On the headset. Yeah, on the headsets. Okay. To, to get them fired up and to get out there. And so... Are these like big suits that they get in? Like, yeah, think, they're like, like mechs. mechs. And how have they been carrying them? Um, so th I, I believe like Roger has one, um, that he wears from time to time. Oh. Um, but otherwise they've been carrying them on the back of the pack beasts, mm -hmm. the Mahouts. Okay. Julie races off in his suit. Um, but one of the, the scummies is, is there, uh, with Roger. Scummies he, means? A Mardukin. Uh, Cronulta. Cronulta. Okay. And he draws a line on the, on the ground with his sword. Uh-huh. And so Roger draws another one. Okay. And they, uh, the Mardukin steps across his and Roger steps across his. And, and so it, it starts this one-on-one -on -one fight. And... Um, so the rest of the Cronulta are respecting this, that it's going to be a one-on-one. -on -one. Right. Okay. Right. And, and so... Um, 
the, uh, this continues with several Mardukas. So he's killing several Mardukas. Oh, so just one, one is stepping at up at a time. So he's good one with his sword. Right. Better so than they are with their own swords. Right. And, and so, you know, he's killing all these different Mardukans. And then uh, Julian gets there with the armor. And he tells him, you know, stay back. Don't cross the line. Um, and uh, and finally, he, he's like, okay, who's in charge? He asks the, the Cronultas. And Julian or Roger. Roger does. And uh, basically what he says is, um, I'm not going to stand here and kill you one-on-one all day. Yeah, because like, there's like 16,000 of them. You're right. And he's like, because now I have the firepower to wipe out every single one of you at once. Are we finally to the part where right now where I said dooming them to extinction? Almost. Okay. Almost. Okay. We're almost there. <laughs> um, so then, you know, they have a display of the plasma gun um, where it blows up this to rock. To show the Cronulta what will happen to show the to And the fire bloom actually burns several of them. So they, they have firsthand experience with, you know, how bad this really is. Uh, so he says, you know, uh, you're going to let us walk in unmolested to, to Voitan. And the, the chieftain says, well, what about tomorrow? And he said, well, tomorrow, P Roger says, well, tomorrow, um, you guys feel free to come and try and kill us if you can. And so that, that separates them. The next day. Why would the Cronulta agree to that? Um, if they have the upper hand right now. So right now, it, it's not the 16,000. Oh. It's a, it's a much smaller group. Oh, okay. And with the plasma gun, he could probably have wiped them all out. Hmm. Um, but that's why he's saying, you know, I, I don't want to deal with this today. We'll deal with it tomorrow. Um, so then the next day... They see the, the, the Colonel is up to about 16,000. Since this was my least favorite part of the book, yes. can you sum it up in a couple sentences? I, you know what? I will do that <laughs> for you. Um, so basically, there's a big battle. Um, the next day. The next day. Uh, the Colonel's are pretty much wiped out. There's a, a second force that shows up. And um, the, the second force... You know, Ponder's like, oh my goodness, uh, you know, we, we were already outnumbered 70 to 16,000. This is the part where they haven't showed up yet. They're like galloping over the hill, do right. do 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 and he thinks that they're bad guys, but they're actually... They're actually the Voitan relief force. This is where they're at three, 31 to 3K. They're still 3K Canolta. Right, right. And, um, but when they see, uh, when the Canolta finally look back and see who's coming... They try even harder to push forward. Okay. And um, so in the in the, all that melee, uh, Roger and Despro both get injured. Right. Okay. But hers is a minor injury. His is. It didn't seem like it. it. Seemed like they were about the same, but she was just like, "Well, gonna toughen up and deal with it anyway." Well, you know, girls are tough. Girls <laughs> are tough. Um, and I think that's a. a did you have well, something for Well, I that? wrote down, turns out it's not Cronulta, but the sons of the clans of Mardukans that the Cronulta slaughtered years ago. At Voitan. Yeah. So they're rising up to avenge their fathers. Right, right. Yeah. Thank you. That was a good two-sentence sum, two sum up of a whole bunch of pages that I wasn't really that yeah, interested in. <laughs> and, and, and I've kind of glossed over some of the... Um, yeah. I did like the part, though... Icky spots. I did like the part, though, that Despero, even though they're both injured, she picks up Roger and carries him yeah. out of the... Wearing his whole field armor and everything, like wearing the heavy um, stuff. No, he didn't have the battle armor at that, at that oh, point. Oh, and Cord's injured, too, right? Cord is, Cord is injured. He has a leg wound. Um, Roger has a, I think it's just a concussion or something, wasn't it? So, um, Cor at this part, Cord is revealed to be female. What? Though the humans assumed from his physiology, because they don't wear clothes that cover the bottom halves, that he was male. But they continue to refer to him with the he pronoun. So, right. and Cord, because of their, their translation software that they're using to talk to each other, which is kind of important to note. They don't speak the same language <laughs> at all. And they, they do like a lot of clapping and stuff. But he's like, I'm not a girl. But actually in the translation, what he's saying is I'm not a man. And he was like real mad that they thought he was the different gender. But 
he was saying I'm not a man because okay, she so, kept saying our translation thing has it opposite. Yeah. So so what it is is it's not like our reproduction. Um, he's what's known as a uh, he has an omni. What do they call it? Omni. He's like the bearer. Yes. He's like would hold the young yes. rather than implant the young. Correct. So it's not as simple as male and female, but Correct. the closest okay, like that O'Casey can say is like he's more like the female because he has the womb. Right. Okay. All right. Well, believe it or not, we're actually reaching the climax of the book. They're about to go to a third city. Where when they third get city. to that city, let me just make sure I'm not jumping anything. They resume their march toward the sea. They arrive at the kingdom of Marshad, Marshad, which appears to have a stark divide between the high and low members of society. So basically there's a king and there's like his guards and his people. And then all of the rest of the kingdom is poverty. Poverty. Like yes. terrible poverty. They're not growing any food for these people. The people right. are all starving because the king wants them to grow this crop that provides him with wealth. And they all work on growing him the crop. Deanda. And they don't grow any food. And so everyone's Correct. starving except for the king. Correct. They get a really weird vibe from the people and they decide that they need to be more wary while they're here because they're like, this feels like pretty sus. We need to protect Roger. There mm -hmm. might be assassins around. Yes. Okay. The king starts poisoning all of Roger's people yes. with this food and the humans eat the food and they're like, this food tastes really bad, but like we're going to keep eating it. Yeah. We're, and really bitter, but we're going to keep eating it because it's, we want to be polite or whatever. And the king thinks he's like so smart because he's like, I'm feeding them this tasteless poison and they would die immediately, but the king's going to give them an antidote Yes. at the same time. So Casey tells Roger finally why his father was expelled from the court. There's not an emperor of man. There's an empress of man. She is in charge and her... Roger's father was just a man that she slept with. She wasn't married to. He doesn't have the same dad as his siblings. Right. And they thought that he was going to start to try to, like, get her assassinated or, like, he would... They thought he was pretty sus. So they kicked him out of the whole place. And Roger, well, even though he wasn't grown in her womb, she pl planted him in another, like, side womb baby growing machine. <laughs> but she's, she still really loved him. But then, like, after he was a little bit old, she, he was basically only raised by nannies and almost never saw his mom. Yeah, because as he was growing up, the she noticed the... Uh, he looked a lot like his father. He looked a lot like his father. And that kind of distanced her from yeah. him. Um, and then as he grew up, he actually started, um, you know, we were talking about the clothes horse and that's how his dad was. Yeah. But he was also, um, he was really into, uh, I think, polo. Was it polo? So he started liking and doing some of the things that the his father dad. did. So she just automatically assumed that like either somebody was actually contacting him from the father's land and getting yes. him to try to depose her or he was just naturally going to do it. And so she yeah. was distancing herself she from him. She him. And O'Casey finally tells him that, and he gets pissed. Yeah, because, yeah. And, and, and it's, it, you know, it's understandable because this is the first he's hearing of it. He He's grown up his whole life not knowing why his father got kicked out. Um, and he never knew his father. Right, right. Yeah. He never knew his father, and um, he, he, did, he had no understanding of, of what had happened. Um, and when O'Casey tells him about it and she's like, well, I assumed that your tutor before me had talked about it. So I never went into it with you. And he's like, well, it's great that everybody assumed I knew because, you know, no one told me. Yeah. So. So his whole identity, he feels like it's just. And it's kind of I, I've noticed this a lot in books where certain characters will be like. I'm not going to give this other character the whole picture because like they don't really need to know or who knows what they're going to do with it. But a lot of times the authors are being like, don't make choices for somebody else. Like let them mm -hmm. make their own choices, give them the information, like don't hold stuff away from them. It, like you think that you're helping them, but you're not. So anyway, he's really frustrated because yes. his mom never told him and he yes. was like, why couldn't she just trust me? Like I wasn't going to go do that stuff. But I've been out of the loop on everything yes. because she could never trust me. Yes, yes. Yeah. So um, he's like real mad. He takes a huge tissy fit. Um, but very soon after, he uh, I'm gonna I'm skipping a thing really quick. Right in between the part of the giant fit and the part where he makes a big character step forward, there's 
Donat is Cord's nephew. Donat is one of the nice. Marjorie that's been with him. Donat is stalking a spy. Spoilers! Donat is <laughs> stalking a spy. This whole thing's been spoilers. <laughs> all spoilers. And all spoilers all the time. He's planting a package on a bridge down the river. Okay, so this is another part in the book where I got okay. a little bit confused. I don't know who wanted him to stalk the spy. I don't know who the spy is. You find out later why he puts the thing on the bridge. But I kind of got lost about why he was stalking this woman. And who's okay. and is she a bad guy or a good guy? So so she is um Is she for the other city? No. Okay. No, she was uh her family was originally from Voitan. Okay. Um they're in Marshad now because, you know, it's one of the habitable cities. Barely. Barely. But then we cut to to the, the Dinat scene and basically what he's doing is um, Portenia was in the bar. Portenia's the armorer. The armorer that, that Phoebe He was in Phoebe the bar really likes. at the impoverished city. Right, right. They, impoverished. And, and um, they were playing cards, and uh, they realized that uh, the spy was trying to, to get a hold of them. Okay. Um, but she was using a different dialect, so the software was having issues with it. Okay. Um, How was she trying to get a hold of them? Uh, she was singing a song. Oh. In, in a different language than the Marshads use. Uh-huh. Um, uh, I believe it was the Voitan language. Oh. And, but it, it had a different dialect to it than the software was used to. Oh, I'm bummed I missed that part. Yeah. And, and so <laughs> so they, they get together. Um, they put together a plan. They have a meeting with the spy. The, uh, the humans go ahead and uh, kind of sign up with them. Because the leadership's all being captured in their... Wow. Right? I totally missed this part. Yeah. Okay. So, anyhow, <laughs> so the king of Marshad... Right. Um, ...imprisons all the leadership uh, of... of the humans. Oh. And he makes them, like, uh, write a note saying the the Marshads are in charge of, of the troops. Including Roger? Well, Yeah. Basically, then um, they make a deal so that the other city and uh, the humans are going to kind of ally, ally against the uh, Marshadans. The king's not making that deal. No, Rogers. Rogers' group is. Okay. So during the battle, they cut off uh, some of the Marshad troops go across. So wait explain what this battle is because that battle just like came right in and I was like why are we all of a sudden in a battle so uh, the the king of Marshad Marshad um, is wanting to take over the other city the other city right okay. and um, basically he wants to take over all the cities in the basin um, starting with that, that, that next city as they're doing that Roger and Ponner are with the king and they they kill everybody in the that's right in the, rogers in, pointing his gun at somebody and then he turns around and kills the king yes yes so, but that's after he's been told he's been poisoned because otherwise the king wouldn't be no there's a second king it, yes oh my gosh so it gets so confusing so what they do is they put the assassin that met them on the bridge who is the leader of that coup attempt takes over and he's supposed to supply I thought you said the assassin on the bridge was a girl. Because Donat was like, I'm following this lady. She's like, swish, swish, that's, swish. That's the one from the bar. Oh. Okay. So this is one thing that I really needed clarification on. So the person who takes over after the first king is murdered. Yes. He's somebody that was in their spy thingy. Yes. Okay. Because I didn't know who that guy was. I was like, how come he's taking over? He was the first spy that we met for Mish oh, okay. Mishad. Okay. Okay. So, so he he's about to double cross them. Right. Yeah. So he, he takes over and um, he's like, okay, so. They're like, okay, we're going to go. We helped you with this battle. And he's right. like, nope. Well, there, Roger goes in and he's like, okay, so you promised us all this stuff. Yeah. We're now like three days late. Yeah. Where's, where's our where's supplies? Where, yeah. Where's our supplies? And um, the. the uh, Let's see where I'm at on it. Keep going. Oh, if you want to. Well, I we 
we've moved over the part where Roger gives a great apology speech, finally oh, showing his oh, maturity. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's right before this battle. So he stands up in front of all the people and he's like, here's the thing. I am not treasonous to my mother. I yes. was just upset at her because she's my mother. My mother, yes. I support the queen. I am loyal to her. And I just really want to apologize to you. And it's like the first time in the book that you're like, oh, he's made some big strides. Big strides. And learning how to be an adult. Yes. Take some responsibility for his own actions. Forgive himself and move forward. So, by the way, the king that they are helping originally, his name is Raj Humas. Raj Humas. Raj Humas. And I don't remember what the second king's name is. You know, I... I he's only a king for a little I, bit. Very, very little. <laughs> it, it, it's so... Not, he's not even a footnote in Marshawn. Oh, Bijan. Bijan. Bijan for men? Bijan for men? So Roger goes to the new Marduk and King Bijan. And he threatens that the humans won't leave because they've been poisoning them and have to stay and help him conquer more things. That's what Bijan. He's like, ha, 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 ha. You've actually been poisoned. Yes. If you don't help me, I won't give you the antidote. The antidote. And Roger informs him that he hasn't been eating their food lately. Yes. He's like, he stopped eating it anyway. And besides that, they aren't even susceptible to the same poisons because they don't have the same physiology. Right. Right. So he's like, actually, you're dumb. He's yeah. like, face. And then does it kill him? Uh, I don't think he kills him because I didn't write he, that part down. He, he does. Oh, he does kill him. He, he does. But oh. Well, then who does he leave to be in charge of this whole city? It's somebody that's going to grow better crops. The... Um, I can't think of his name, but he is the the spy from the OMG with these spies. I know, right? Yeah, spies spies are us. So he was one of Bijan's cronies, but he's a good dude, not a well, bad dude. So he's not he's not the spy. He's the spy's dad. Bijan's dad? No, not Bijan, the, the other the spy. The other spy. The other okay, spy. Okay, that was waddling on the bridge. Waddling I don't know why I remembered that, but Dinat was like following her, and he's like, "Woo, woo. yes, yes, yes." Okay. That that is <laughs> that is the one. <laughs> okay, um, so Ponner. At this point, I wrote down Ponner realizes that Roger actually commands the Bronze Battalion now. It's like at this point when Roger's done all of this work on himself, and then he steps forward to actually take political responsibility. responsibility yeah. He's like, okay. Roger's actually in control. Right, right. So, so he admits the to himself. To at himself, least, not to Roger. Right. Yeah. That um, you know, this is uh, this is a big turning point for Roger, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a it's a huge turning point. And he's like not series. as scared about it anymore, right? Right, right. Because in the beginning, it was uh, you know, Ponder had you know basically just a snot nosed brat. Mm -hmm. um, and watching his fellow comrades just sacrifice themselves for him, yeah, like would be really hard for him. I remember that Roger was like, "How is Ponner not stepping to me and being like, you're a horrible person? You don't even realize yeah. they're sacrificing themselves." Yeah. And then you get Ponner's perspective, and he's like, "You know, I've been holding it in. Like, yeah. obviously, I'm feeling I, terrible. I have to deal with it. Yeah, it's, 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 yeah, it is what it is. Yeah." So my last note says they resume their march up country. They do. So they get back on their little, I'm imagining them like Kodos on WoW. They get back on their Kodos Kodo, and they're just Kodo. like, boom, boom, yeah. boom, boom. See, I, when I think of it, I kind of imagine like a turtle shell. Okay. You know? What is the name of these creatures again? We're talking about the things that they started riding after they got to Cord's Village. Yeah, I can't remember the name of it. Anyway, I, so they're I'm riding sorry. on their turtles. Well, they're not really turtles. In, in my mind, they are they like have a giant turtle shell. Okay. Right? And the big webbed feet. Webbed feet? Okay. Yeah, they do have webbed feet because remember when they crossed the Mohinga? Nope. Okay. So anyhow. <laughs> Is that the big lake bed thing? Is that the Mohinga? Yeah. And Roger keeps going, the Mohinga. Mohinga. I don't remember what that's about. Yeah, it's okay. Okay. It's in the book. <laughs> If you read the book, it's in there. You should read it. If it, any, of, yeah. if this sounds at all appealing to you, granted, if you don't like description of death in the battles, like me, there is some of that. But it's there not. Is some. It's not the whole book. There is still some enjoyable yeah. character development. So they start marching back, and that's the end. That is the end yeah. of the book. So I wrote down um, some questions for us to ponder. Which scene stuck with you the most? I think probably the part where Roger is talking to the king at the end. 
Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, if I was to answer that, for me, it was actually the uh, the standoff with Roger in the Cronulta. Oh, where he's killing them one by one? He's killing them one by one. And ironically, I didn't even take a note on that. Yeah. But I like how it's like, you cross the line. Like where that phrase comes from, you cross the line. Yeah. You You know, know? you draw your line in the sand and. You cross the line. Don't, do not, do not. Wow. Okay. Do not not step to the Don't step to me. Yeah. Yeah. What's the next one? (laughs) That reminds me of that Impractical Jokers last night where he's like, you step to me? We're on the brook of love bachelor thingy where mm-hmm. he's like he he performs his answer in a rap and it's like you step to me oh Remember yeah that? yes yes i do we now. like impractical jokers um would you read watch other things from this uh author yes oh well authors i th- yeah if they're if they are writing together Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the other one that I read, I only read one of it because I was very bored. We know what your answer is. Yeah, I, I, I definitely, because I've read... <sighs> I've, all? I've, I, I wouldn't say all. All of these 500 books. I, I've read uh, a majority of both of these authors' yeah. books. Yeah, Tim um, loves this series. I do. What surprised you the most? Um... I guess it surprised me that there was significant humor in here, which oh. made me really happy. And it reminded me a lot of the Pierce Brown books that we read, the Red Rising books. Red Rising, yeah. I really like those because it's a mix of like the space opera, the battle, all the different creatures and peoples and species. And, but then there's also like really random funny things in there. Yeah. So I like that. I, for me, it was all about the, the turnaround. How can um, this book surprise you, though, if you've read it so many times? Well, it, well, it didn't surprise me this time because I could probably, <laughs> uh, for the most part, write it. What's the turnaround to you? Uh, Prince Roger. Oh, you're surprised at his character arc. Yeah, especially in the first book. Like, a lot of times, um, if, if you're going to have a series, oh. it doesn't necessarily happen that fast. So you thought he should have stayed a brat longer. No, I was pleasantly surprised that... That he didn't. That he didn't. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, he stepped up. Um, How did your opinion change as you read it? My opinion changed, like, chapter two, getting right into it, that I was like, oh, this isn't going to just be all about describing spaceships and Mm -hmm. the and the boiler rooms of the spaceships <laughs> like yay yeah, so i was yeah. i right away into it i was like okay good okay yeah this one it, i think for me it had the right amount of uh, technical yeah. and, and and everything else so um would you reread it would i reread it um, I mean, if they made this into a movie, I would definitely watch it. I mean, I guess I would probably reread it. Like, after finishing the tr- the trilogy, mm. I might come back and reread it. Sure. I don't feel that I need to reread it right now. Okay. okay. But, yeah, I would reread it. Okay. Yeah, and I know you would so reread it. I I have read this series literally a, a dozen times. Yeah, I'm always like, Tim, why don't you read something new? Which is kind of... Yeah the catalyst for this podcast because i'm always like read something else but he's you guys know if you're readers you have like a comfort read where you read it and it just feels very good you know what to expect you enjoy the characters you enjoy the plot and the actions and stuff and sometimes you just want to reread something you've already read and and, uh honestly one of the the beautiful things about audible is this is not an ad, by the way. It is not. We are not paid by he anybody means for any anything. any listening service, not yeah. just Audible. Well, I'm sorry. That's the one that I personally use. Yeah. Um, the nice part about that for me is um, sometimes reading and listening to to the books is so calming and soothing. Mm-hmm. It, it helps me to go to sleep, yeah. to be honest. And I've heard a lot of people say that, too. And, well, helps us stress if, lowering to go to sleep. Yeah, but if you're if you're starting a new book, it's mm-hmm. really hard. It's hard to do that. Yeah. It is. It is because then you wake up and you're like, I don't remember what was going on, and now I'm in chapter thirty-seven. Yeah. But I was on chapter three 
<laughs> when I started before bed. I'm pretty sure Audible has a timer where it'll turn off. It does. Yeah. It does. And I have hit that timer several times. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it, to me, having a, a book like this that I enjoy... Listening to it and rereading it, and yeah, it's very comfortable, and I would absolutely read it. And you would recommend it? I would absolutely recommend it. I in, would too. In fact, the only thing that I found disturbing was the descriptions of the bodies being grossly oh, yeah. destroyed. That's yeah. the part I didn't like, but I can understand that. Uh, but like I was saying, in fact, I I actually downloaded the second book. You're getting ready for our next read. Well, I suggested to him that after we read the one I pick, it's going to be his turn again and we should read something else, like a different kind of genre. Absolutely. Because the point is to expose each other to It's probably going like. to be another David Weber book, though. No! <laughs> I want to read another author. You like vampires? David Weber writes vampires. So I think that pretty much wraps up this episode. I think it does. This gives you a pretty good idea of what this podcast is going to be like. Our next episode is going to be discussing a film. We're going to, it'll probably be a little shorter because the film watch is an hour and a half versus reading a book was like 13 hours or it was, whatever, however it was long this was. actually longer than that. Yeah, I think it was 19 hours on Audible. That's if you have it on one speed. <laughs> oh my goodness, no wonder you missed stuff. No I'm wonder gonna, I went through it faster than you. I'm going to put all the books that you give me on like five speed. No, you will not because your job is going to be to tell the summary when it's my book. Yeah, just like I I'll just the read the cover. Yours. Oh, my gosh. Well, you guys, if you enjoyed, please um, don't forget to subscribe. Thumbs up the video. Leave us your comments. If you're going to read this book, if you've read this book, let us know. Sure, you probably, yeah. many of you have read this book. Let us know your thoughts down below. You can answer our questions. Maybe I'll leave those yeah. in, the, in the description bar, and you can answer them for yourself and let us know what you think. And we hope you join us for the next one. So who won? Um, this is Zabadextra v. Bifo. I think that you <laughs> won because... <laughs> Um, I think that you won because you suggested this book and I ended up liking it. Good. So I think that you're the winner. Also, you won because you remembered a lot of the pivotal points that I forgot. It so helps. It helps. I'm going to give you that. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, with that, we're going to see you next time. We hope you have a great day. Should we, should we mention what we're going to do next? The next video? Um, the next video, we're going to be reviewing the film The Menu. The Menu. Which was on a lot of people's top films of 2022 and we definitely have some opinions on it we definitely do yeah we definitely do so we'll quick, see you back quick summary is what the boo? <laughs> yeah that's pretty accurate okay we'll see you back next time you guys have a great day all right bye bye